Hello, and welcome to Learn to Draw Gourds with John Muir Laws. We are so glad you're joining us today. My name is Beth Kelly Galogali, and I'm the founding director of the Wild Wonder Foundation, which is hosting this class today. The Wild Wonder Foundation is dedicated to encouraging nature connection and conservation through attention, curiosity, art, science, and community. We strive to make nature and nature journaling accessible to everyone by sponsoring the annual Wild Wonder Nature Journaling Conference, as well as other events, educational workshops, field trips, teacher trainings, retreats, grants, and other activities and projects in support of our mission, like this class today. You can learn more about our work at wildwonder.org. We are so grateful to today's teacher, John Muir Laws, who is an award-winning author, writer, illustrator, and educator with nearly four decades of teaching experience. Jack is the co-founder and president of the Wild Wonder Foundation, and he is the author and illustrator of The Law's Guide to Nature Drawing and Journaling, The Law's Guide to Drawing Birds, The Law's Sketchbook, and other books. He is donating his time today to teach this class, and all funds raised will support food security for orphaned children at the Imani Children's Home in Tanzania. Thank you, Jack. Um, so I'm John Muir Laws, and I am really delighted and honored that you are with us today. Uh, this is going to be a, I think, a really interesting workshop with you for you because in the course of this workshop, we'll we'll get to um, some specifics about drawing gourd, just pictures, but but the concepts in this class are also can be widely applied. Um, across lots of different drawing topics and subjects. So I think you'll find today's work generally useful. But in addition to that, today's class is, uh, we're kind of getting in the, at least in the United States near our, our holiday of Thanksgiving, a time which we give thanks and, and sort of celebration for, for the abundance that we have around us. And so um, in, in, in recognition of that, uh, we are partnering with the um, Amani Children's Center um, in in Tanzania, and this is a uh, a, a program that we've had uh, sort of established roots with um, oh, for a few years now, and we are um, we are we're delighted and honored to, to be here with you. This workshop is a, in addition to being on how to draw gourds, it's a fundraiser. And all the funds which we collect um, today are going to go to support food security at this um, amazing organization. So I would like to um, introduce to you my friend, uh, uh, Gideon Moenia from uh, Tanzania and um, the students of, uh, of, of the Imani Center. So we're delighted to be here with all of you today. Welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, your presence at this third class today in partnership with uh, John Muni Laws and the uh, Wild Wonder Foundations uh, means the world to us. And my name is Gideon Leonard, Leonard Mawenya. I'm the manager of the Imani Children's Home. And I'm speaking on behalf of my team, our beneficiaries, and uh, Dr. Catherine Thompson, uh, who is the uh, with my partner in leadership at the Amani Foundation. Uh, please uh, let me take uh, this Hannah to introduce you, my uh, lovely family here in Tanzania, from Amani Children's Home. Okay, uh, Amani Children's Home stands as a beacon of light in the lives of children. Uh, who are facing an, uh, an unmanageable hardship. And uh, our mission is not just about providing a uh, shelter, uh, it's about offering hope, yeah, healing, and a uh, bright future. But we don't stop there. We believe in the power of art as healing force. Art therapy has proven to be an uh, essential tool in helping these children uh, to overcome their traumas and express their emotions. And through art, they find their voice and uh, begin the, uh, the journey of healing. And that's not all. We're deeply committed to environmental education and uh, natural journaling. And we believe that connecting with nature empowers these children to become future leaders. Through environmental education, uh, they learn to appreciate and protect the environment. And in doing so, they become stewards of our planet. 
and the Amani Foundation, who are based in US, uh, who is uh, which is US uh, charity based in US, USA, plays a vital role in supporting these initiatives. With the help, we not only provide shelter and care, but also offer holistic healing, education, educational empowerment, and the potential relocation with their family. Uh, we invite you to join our mission to become a part of, uh, of this inc uh, incredible journey of hope and transform uh, transformation. And every contribution, whether big or small, changes lives and make a huge difference. Together, we can empower these children uh, to heal, grow, and become future leaders who will make a positive impact uh, on our world. In Swahili, we say, uh, we say asante, which means thank you very much. Uh, asante Gideon, um, we're really, really delighted to be here in, in, in partnership with you. And I look forward to seeing you and uh, the, the, the students at Amani again this coming summer. Um, thank you very much. So um, I wanted just to tell you folks a little bit why I think this is this is is is, is really important. Um, so I grew up in the United States in part of California, and um, the idea of of food insecurity is not something that has ever been part of my personal experience. And the um, I I realized that I take it for granted that I can go to the store and I can kind of get things that, that I need. And that's not, that's not the case everywhere. That's not the case in Tanzania. Tanzania is one of the most food insecure countries in the world. And, um, and so it, it actually, it doesn't take very much to kind of for, for the, 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 the food budget of the Amani Foundation, I think for one year, it's like 12K. And that made me realize like, wow, this is, this is, this is a place that we can make, we can make a really a, a big difference. So in this season um, of, 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 of thanks and in this, this, this time of abundance, I've, I want to try to get myself to be intentional about thinking about how, um, what I'm grateful for, how my current circumstances is just out of, out of luck of the draw. And also what I can do to help um, make, um, make things uh, work a little bit better. So um, that's why we've got a, found, a fundraiser here today. And all the money which we raise from this is going to go to support Amani. Um, and I would like to kind of double down on that um, and make, um, here's my matching grant offer. Um, what I'd like to do today is I would like to put up $1,000 for a, and see if y'all can match me. For every donation over $100, I will give $100 um, to the Amani Foundation, um, up to our one thousand dollars, and hopefully we'll go even, even further past that. And I want to invite you to join me in making this possible to see how much of a dent in the um, the, the annual food budget um, of this amazing center um, we can we can make. So <clears throat> to inspire us to do that. We're going to take a little look more closely at our food, and I think that gourds are are, are a really um, fun way to do that. I'm kind of doing this is this is my kind of uh, sleepy hollow uh, routine here, um, and because there are some some of the structure of a gourd, um, we can apply to drawing all sorts of different things. So we're going to start with something like this. And we're going to kind of work our way into all sorts of more different things. Sort of gourds are are are, are interesting thing. Basically, what what you mean um, when we talk about a gourd is some kind of some squash, but generally a squash that is not used regularly for for eating. And the way this kind of decorative gourd came about is that there are sometimes when you're trying to make gourds for eating, 
or or squash for eating, um, it, it doesn't come out the way that you think it will. And so, so there are mutations and some things kind of look weird and funky. And so um, those would get discarded. And then people started to, to notice that those were cool. So either discarded because they don't have a lot of flesh inside or that the seeds are bitter. By the way, these don't have a lot of good flesh inside and the seeds are bitter. Um, but but those um, often are really interesting. And that's as nature journalers, that's also something that we kind of lean in on. When something is weird, we want to try to geek out on that and figure out why. So we'll be looking at this. We'll be looking at some of these and then seeing what we can do to get to start to visually represent this down on our piece of paper. And then um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start sort of more abstract and simple with, with, with more of the generic pumpkin. And then we're going to get all lumpy and ridgy and weird and things with lots of lumps and ridges and and sort of a complex structure. Some people look at this like, like, oh, no, I don't think I know how to approach drawing that. But there's a few basic principles that you can use here that make it a lot easier. So let's start with my dry erase pen. I'm going to draw on my pumpkin. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by, um, I noticed that there are these, these lines that are um, sort of longitude lines going around the globe of my pumpkin. I'm going to take one of those lines and trace it. And that will be kind of our prime meridian. There it is. And what I want you to note is that from this angle, from this angle, well, no, yeah, that's this angle. From this angle, it makes a straight dent line right through the center of our pumpkin. Okay. And it doesn't matter if I turn the pumpkin this way or uh, this way, I'm still getting a straight, whoops, there we go a straight line right through the middle of my pumpkin. Hmm. Hmm. So there's the straight line that is actually, if I hold my pumpkin like this, you can see, if you kind of look at it another way, that's got a real curve to it. Hmm. Let's kind of look at this observation a little bit more. I'm going to start with this, start with this here. And what I'm going to do is I am going to turn my pumpkin um, this way. And I want you to notice that straight line gets a little bit of a curve, gets a little bit more curve, gets a lot of curve until it is the edge of the pumpkin. So it gets, finally it gets the full actual curve of the pumpkin. But look at this, there's a new straight line that is taken over in the middle of the pumpkin. Now, this simple observation here, that we go from straight to curvy, curvy, curve, 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 is huge for us as graphic artists and illustrators who want to draw what we see. Let's make a diagram of that, because if we can take what we see and turn it into a diagram, it's easier for us to keep that diagram in our heads and be able to apply it to different things. So again, the lessons which we're learning today about drawing the pumpkin are going to be widely applicable uh, applicable across a whole bunch of, um, of, 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 of different drawing challenges. So let's boom down here. All right. And how am I going to start? Let's start just by lightly drawing in a ball. You can grab any pencil for this. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by lightly drawing a circle. And what I do is I, I'm not pressing hard, I'm just lightly putting pressure down and I make several circles. And as I do that, I can kind of get closer to something that is more round. This part that sticks out too much, I can kind of cut that off. If I want it to stick out more in a certain place, I can. So I can get 
something that's round. And as I start to get something round on the piece of paper, I'll press a little bit more firmly. Now, what I'm going to do is find the middle of this, this little pumpkin shape. So I want to try to put a little tick mark in the middle of the top. Think of kind of where that is in the bottom. And I'm going to try to first lightly here and kind of go, if I go down there, is that going to really cut this in half? I want a straight line. Yeah, that's going to work. Straight line right through there. And you sort of see as this spins around, um, <clears throat> that line stays right there in the middle. Now, as I spin the pumpkin, this line that is coming from here to here is going to start here, stop here. It is going to, the middle of it, let's kind of put in a little bit of a guideline at a right angle here, right through the middle. The middle of it is going to come through a point here, 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 progressively further out. So imagine the straight line getting more curved and more curved and more curved until it is the edge of the pumpkin. Where is this? Here we go. So I've got my straight line, and then it becomes more curved and more curved, more curved, more curved, more curved until it's out there. Now, the point at which it is the furthest from the line is going to be the middle here. So that's going to be the top of my arc. And I want my top of my arc to pass through that. So I'm going to kind of come out of here, up through there, and then down into here. Watch out. All right. And then let's start here come up through that point, sort of flatten out through that point, and then back down. And I come out, back down. I recently have been drawing the moon a lot. This has been my approach for drawing the moon. So I have, I have these lines. Getting more, more curved out there. Now, just a little footnote on the moon. If you're drawing the moon and you see the moon up in the sky, here's just a the quick and so this way so we're going to start to see that these ideas apply to lots of different things. If I'm drawing the moon in the sky. I start with whatever phase it is. I just lightly draw myself a circle. And then I look at where on that circle is the crescent part of it, the tip of the crescent part of it. And I put a little, little line on there saying that the crescent is pointing towards this way. And so that's going to be the, the maximum point of, of where it is, because I want, to get, I want to get this this crescent pointing in the right directions. And then at 90 degrees from that is going to be the axis of the tilt of that moon. So from there, from this point up here to this point down here, I'm going to draw a line that at its maximal point will come through here. I want to avoid doing this. I don't want to bounce up to it and down. I want it to be, I want it to be kind of a curve through maximum up there and then down to there. And that will give you, whether you're drawing this part, the gibbous part, or this part, the crescent, that moon shape and the angle that it is sitting in the sky. <laughs> so, uh, that is, uh, let me just sort of show you some, some, some lunar musings here. So this is my most recent uh, spate of lunacy. Um, you can see that I am uh, every morning um, getting the location of the moon in the sky and recording where that, how that is changing. 
as the as the day goes on or not as the day goes on as the as the month progressed um and so you can i'm paying attention to the angle of these sorts of things so what's something you'll never see by the way you won't see a moon do this where you notice if this is the halfway point see how these little points here are sneaking Whoop, let's go let's see down on that see these little parts sneaking past that half line you're not going to see that that's in in cartoons that's the way they draw moons and some flags but we never actually see them so that's not what we're doing but this is this applies very directly to the pumpkin there's a more an interesting thing going on here if we flatten the poles of this or even make the pole indented so that on our pumpkin what you've actually got if you were to slice this through here is whoop, right up here um, um there's it drops in you can see the little shadow in here this is kind of dropping in there and a little bit on this side too. So those ends are dropping in. So you're seeing, uh, if you were to kind of get a cross section of this, you would actually get a, we're gonna go in there and we're gonna go in here, little, out there where the flower was. This means that now I'm going to draw on top of this a little bit more. Here we go. That the edge we as we see this of this pumpkin comes around here, comes across the top flat, and down here, then over here across the top flat and out of your view, there's a little bit of an indentation. So that means that you're not going to see all these lines as you do on the moon coming to a point here and a point here, because the point where they come together is actually in this little indentation. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this line here, you're still going to see come down perfectly straight. But this line over here, you're going to see it tuck in here and tuck in here. And you're not going to see it all gather to a point up there. Over here, what do I see? I see my line is going to come in here and in here. So notice that these points here, boom, 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 these are not all actually hitting at that same point anymore. So we start with our idea of the sphere. We now have pumpkinized it. Now I'm gonna just go back to pumpkin cam for one minute more. Did I freeze? Hope I'm still with you. You're doing great, thank you. Oh, good. All right, tomorrow's my little line on my pumpkin. Oh, you're no lines on that pumpkin. Well, ha, here we go. So just take a look at, bear in mind the model that we just did, right? I tilt this and you can see whoop, that line moving as we've done, as it does in that modified model. And now one more idea to this, because these little grooves, are in between little ridges. So as we go around the pumpkin, I have a bump and a furrow, a bump and a furrow, a bump and a furrow. So it's bump, furrow, bump, furrow, bump, furrow, bump, furrow. I can see that a little bit better on this pumpkin, right? And because, here we go, because my bump is sticking up, it can hide um, a little bit of the furrow that is behind it. So that means,
we'll draw this on this side over here, that if I see all of this part here, kind of bump this up here, I'm going to bump it up here. Um, this next part, you want to sort of think of it as tucking in behind that one just a little bit. Sort of there, so the, these ends are depending on the size of that bump can give you a little bit of, you can see a little bit of these bumps, especially on the top edges of these, where this comes in here, this might dip down in. Let's zoom down on that more. So that you have this edge of my pumpkin here. So this is this is pumpkin in theory. Now we're gonna we're gonna do pumpkin for real. So you see how I'm getting a sense of the shape of the top of this and the bumpiness of this bump ridge here. Because as, as I come down here, here's the top of my bump ridge. I'm tucking down behind this next one. So that's just something that I'm going to look for. I might not see it everywhere, but places where there are big bumps sticking up. On these edges here, I might see evidence of the bumpness. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to the real, to the real pumpkin view. Ah. And what I'm going to do is I am going to get my assistant set up right here. Tilt this down a little bit. Come on. Aha. Let's go around to a nice little view of the pumpkin. Um, now, now, there is a so I can see over here, you can see that how that top edge is whoop, kind of giving you a little sense of that. Is this one? Yeah, this one's a little bit more bumpy. Yeah, this will show that a little bit better. We're going to switch out pumpkins. We're about to draw a pumpkin. No, oh, look at that. Now, see, if I orient, if I have my pumpkin sitting so that one of these cracks is straight down towards the middle here. It is actually what I'm seeing, but it can end up looking a little bit fake, even though that's this is real. Because everybody will look at like, like, oh my gosh, there's a straight line going down the middle of the pumpkin. Why'd you cut that in half? Um, to help people kind of get the sense of the roundness of this, these little contour lines, these cross contour lines are gonna really help. And it's gonna help if I just rotate this, the start just a little bit like that, right? Now, let's make a few observations about this. Oh, look here on the bottom. Remember those those those, those little kind of whoop uh, right there. Remember those 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 little whoop -de whoop -de whoops that I was showing on the bottom of that pumpkin in theory. You're really seeing that nicely here. So that's a great place to pay attention to. Places up here where you're sort of seeing a little bit of that same thing. Those are really great moments to to, to pay attention to. But let's just make a few other observations here light is coming in and hitting right here. So I have light from this window and it's coming through and it's making this part of my pumpkin glow, making this part of my pumpkin in deeper shadow, All right? Notice in the shadow areas how prominent those cracks are. And notice that here in this area, I can see the hint of it, but it's not really in my face. So in addition to showing the contour of this, with my line work itself, I can start to suggest the lights and darks of this pumpkin. All right. So, so what I'm what I'm going to do is I am going to um, we're going to make a light sketch of this, and um, as as we do. I'm going to suggest that 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 you you're going to draw your own pumpkin, and 
Um, then we'll get into more sort of complex pumpkin things. But I'm going to first on a piece of paper just sort of lightly show you kind of what my approach is going to be. All right. Then we're going to have this here, and we're all going to sketch this pumpkin. You ready? All right. So here's, in theory, what I'm going to be doing is I'm first going to be looking at the general shape of my pumpkin. Let's zoom down a little bit. I'm going to zoom down a little bit, kind of get the general shape of my pumpkin. Oh, Jack, could you uh, raise your page up just a bit? Uh, oh. Thank you, Abea. I appreciate you being on the, the 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 program with me to to help keep my keep my my pumpkin square. Um, and so I I know I've got one line that could roughly come down like this. I'm going to block in the locations of where I see major cracks. Sometimes the ones that are out here right along this edge are harder to see too. And at first I'm just kind of putting in little placeholders for those cracks. I'm gonna note places in it where um, there are any of those kind of key little kind of edge marks. And, and then what I'm going to do is, as I go about drawing this pumpkin, um, I am going to make lines that are over here in the dark. Look at this as I make this line. Because this is, this is a key drawing trick. And if this becomes, um, so friends at, at, at Amani, if you get this idea into your head early on in your drawing career, it's going to make a huge, huge, huge difference to you. Because what most people do is when they're working with their pencil, they will have one even weight of their pencil. What I want to do is to go for a variable line, sometimes darker, sometimes lighter. See how I did that sort of lighter part in there? And these ones are going to be kind of doing that variable line a little bit more heavily. And over here, the variable line doing it a little bit more lightly. This is the area of my pumpkin that is going to have my biggest highlights. So in that, it's going to be really light. So if I have a line that kind of comes and goes with like sort of where it's heavier, where it's darker, lighten it here, then Maybe I'm going to, towards the bottom of it, really kind of make that lighter. I'm expecting to see kind of a pattern like that. Oh, sorry again, Jack. Uh, could you raise it just a little bit? Oh, yeah. Uh, Over here in the light, as it comes into this light area, make your line really ghosty or even what we call kind of a hit go hit line where your line starts, it stops. There are these gaps in the line, this broken line. So the line can come down in here and then, oh, 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 there it is again. And this one over here, what are you going to do? You're going to come down here. So you see how in this zone here, there are these places where I'm letting this line disappear. And that gives you this sense of like, oh, in this zone here, there's light coming in, right? Um, one last thing I'm gonna do is down in, if this is where my light is, this area in here is gonna be my darkest point. I'm going to actually reinforce some of these lines down here, give them a few even stronger parts on this little area down in here, just to be the opposite of where they're kind of light here. This is the area where I'm going to have my, some of my darkest shadows. Let's go back to the pumpkin cam. Whip. And now you've got a strategy for how to approach it. I'm going to intentionally not show my drawing while we're doing this because then what people tend to do is they're like oh i want to see what you're doing and you'll be watching that instead of actually drawing but i really 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 want you drawing all right remember in this little highlight area that line just 
go ghosty light, 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 and then bring it in, in darker. You look at that line, it, you can see it go, being lighter. Those lines, those cracks across it, you can see the places in them where actually the real thing, you're seeing someplace like, ah, it's dark there. That variable line, ah, that's, you start putting variable lines all over the place in your drawings. And the, the, the interest, the what you can do with your drawings just goes way up. But again, a lot of people would just press one pressure. So even if it's new to you, experiment with that variable line. Get that variable line going. How much of that line can you suggest without having to draw at all? Also notice over here, this one, this little line right here, it's really close to the edge. And I see some others right in here. Harder to see over here, but this one really close to the edge. The spacing between lines, if these were all evenly spaced out, you'd expect them to be, because of foreshortening, a little bit closer together out here. So generally wider spacing here in the middle, narrower spacing closer together on the sides. And you don't have to like mathematically plot them all out. If you're just sort of generally aware, get a few that are closer together out on the sides, it's gonna work. I'm going to give you one more minute to play with to play with this. And while we're doing that, um, I'm going to start to point out a few interesting things about what light and dark do on the face of this pumpkin. And pumpkins are great tools for learning to um, to, uh, to 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 draw any any round object because with these lines on them, they just train our brain to notice certain sorts of details. And here I wanna notice what light does going across the sphere. So again, my light is coming through my window. Wah! Giving me this bright spot here, giving me this zone over here that is darker. Okay, but wait, there's more. Um, because, um, and actually let, let me, let, let, let me let me show that diagrammatically. So if I had this pumpkin and there was an, and and it was entirely smooth and the light was coming in here, it's making this area brighter. Then what I would tend to do is I'm going to lightly put a shadow in on this side. Here I'm just making we've got kind of a dull pencil. And I'm making back and forth little horizontal marks. This area here. And as I get towards this brightest part, it gets lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. 
and I'm going to see where my finger is. Well, actually, I'm going to put, use this as a pointer. This is a zone in here that I'm going to make a little bit darker. It's kind of, I'll call that my core shadow. I'm actually not going to bring the darkness all the way out to this edge because sometimes there's a little bit of light that goes past the pumpkin, hits the object that is back here, bounces a little bit of light back to it. So let me see if I can show that. This is what we call reflected light, all right? So if um, over here I have, um, so here it is without a reflector, and then I bring up here, you can see the, um, you can see that light of the paper actually reflected on the side of the pumpkin. So it's bouncing light. Any bright object over here will bounce a little bit of light onto the dark side of your pumpkin. Um, so even if that's just something that is down on the ground, it will kind of give you a little bit of a glow, meaning that the darkest shadow is going to be not all the way over at the edge. It's going to be a little bit inward from that. So, um, so if I am, again, putting in this darkest shadow, I'm going to have the think of the core shadow uh, as being in this area here. Right. And then that's going to get lighter as we come out until I finally have this 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 little highlight zone, leaving a little bit of reflected light here. So notice I'm going to put an RL here. That's my reflected light, giving you a sense of a little bit of glow coming into this side. And then this is what I'm going to call my center light. All right the light that is closest to under that, that window. This right here is my core shadow, my CS, my core shadow. And so I have these, um, and these are sort of my, so these major parts of my, my sort of thinking as, I, as I'm doing this. Now let's bring in the fact that there are these ridges and lumps on here because check this out. In addition to if this were a perfect sphere, then what I just did, you're done. But there are these ridges and bumps. And look at, at it at each one of those. Each one on the think of the plane of it that is facing the light. So like over here, right here, um, on this surface here, it the surface here is facing the window more directly than it is either over here or over here. And that gives me on this edge right here of this bump, this bump has its own special little highlight zone, right? And then I come over to the next one here. All right, there is, um, I have my highlight zone on the edge that is right in front of the crack. <clears throat> and then I have the same thing happening over here and a little bit over here, right? So notice that over here, there's still on the side that is facing the, that sort of center light area. Um, there's a little bit more light that is going into that area. And it's the opposite with where the shadows are. So look at this, whoops, right there. See this shadow, whoop. It, it's hard because when I'm looking at the screen, I'm seeing this mirror image of this sort of weird inverted thing of what I'm doing. So I'm gonna try, to, uh, okay, this will work. So I go down here and notice there's that shadow on the opposite side as the light. Shadow over here and then light right over here. And you see that same thing over here. I've got the light on this side and I get over here. As it drops down, I'm turning more away from that um, where the, the, the center light is. And it's, it's more in, in shadow. So each one of these little bumps is doing its very own private light to dark thing. And when it's more on the light side, there's less dark and the lights are getting brighter. And on the dark side over here, it's more dark and the darks are getting darker. 
So let's put that in on our generic diagram and, and then see what we can do about that. So that means that as I'm coming down here, as I'm coming down here, I'm going to have that a little bit darker as I'm coming down here on these sides of this. Here I want to think about where my highlights are. My highlights are going to be more towards the center of this center light. Okay, it's a little dark. It's down here. So there, there's going to be lights and darks relative to the individual bumps. Um, something that's fun to do is if you have uh, an eraser, um, you can actually put in some of these little highlights with, with an eraser. If you're using, uh, let's say I had an area of tone across part of my pumpkin i can smear that to sort of make it more of a you know here's some some dark area if you have have a little eraser you can come by and you can pick out some little highlight areas in that as well that's fun to do i'm not going to be able to do that very well on this because this colored pencil doesn't really erase very well but maybe i'll might be able to do that a little bit you there are in some cases really skinny erasers that that people can use those are fun almost like a drawing tool but yeah here's one this is actually an eraser it allows me to kind of come in here and lift out of just i don't want to get it all out but i can put in just i want to make sure that i have highlights in my highlightiest places let's go back to our friend the pumpkin Look at those, look at those. So what we're trying to do here is we're now showing volume with tone, with tone, with light and dark. And so take a look at the real pumpkin and see if we can get your sketch over there to have, have a hint of these. I really like, here's something I'm, I'm really liking that I'm seeing. I'm liking this little bit of darkness that is kind of just creeping up here in the base. Just kind of gives this a little bit more solidity. I think I would emphasize that. Let's do that now on your pumpkin. I'm just gonna play with it for a little bit. Not to be able to finish this. Yet, we can do enough that we'll be able to really. Oh, I'm liking the shadow that is on the. Um, the, the inside of that crack there. I don't feel like you have to finish the entire thing. Drawing's not a gift that some people have and some people don't. It's a skill that you develop by putting in lots of pencil models. The more you do, the better and better it's going to get. So give yourself time, give yourself permission 
to put in those pencil miles. The more pencil miles you put in, the more your brain starts to grow connections of neurons around this activity of drawing. And that's what you want it to do. So if you're thinking to yourself, like, I don't, like, where would that kind of shadow show up on there? Look back at the pumpkin. The pumpkin's got all the answers to it. So we've had a chance to play with that a little bit. Um, now I just want to show you a strategy with um, dumping some color in on top of that. Um, depending on the, the medium that you have accessible to you, some people have colored pencils, some people have watercolor. There is no, um, there's no kind of ideal or right set of tools that you need to have. Um, I'm going to show, just demonstrate a little thing here with um, watercolor and gouache. Um, I usually don't show stuff with, um, uh, with, with, with gouache, but it is, uh, it's just so I want to show you kind of a neat thing you can do with paint. So let's grab a paint set. So Jack, we're almost at the halfway point of our class. And I was thinking before we start painting, perhaps we could take one minute to stand up do a little personal dance break, shake out our hands and feet, focus our eyes far away instead of close since we've been looking oh, so idea. close for a while. Good so idea. let's take one minute starting right now. You can keep your camera on if you wanna show us your dance moves and stand up, shake it out. Shake out your arms, shake out your legs, woohoo. Shake out your fingers, do some open and close. Wow, 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 jazz hands. Oh, and. Uh... And, and I'll just make you think that I'm doing the moonwalk because I can't really moonwalk. <laughs> but if you can't see my feet, you don't know. That's right. It's just walking backwards in a fancy way. Everyone, shake out your hands. Shake out your arms. Take your eyes and look at something far away. All right. About 20 more seconds. Wow. He's doing the twist. Pumpkin boogie. All right. Oh. I hope you hope you had a chance to stretch out. Thanks for joining us in that little dance break. All right. Want to put some color on here? Woohoo. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a kind of uh, a kind of a, a quick way of playing with watercolor to get um, shadows on an object and to, and to play with color. Should you be doing stuff with watercolor? And there's a the pumpkin. And let's see, I'm gonna change this angle here. There's a little pumpkin. Hey, little pumpkin. Um, so check this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little bit of purple gray paint. I've got a little bit of purple gray paint here. Wondering, I don't have purple gray paint in my palette. What do I do? I'm going to grab some purple, All right? And then I can mix that with some gray and wow, I get a purple gray paint. Or you can have, oh, well, anyway, that was what was going on there. Look, it's paint, it's purple, it's gray, it's purple gray. Um, and what I'm going to do is, First, I'm going to get my brush clean. I'm going to put a little bit of water in this area, like a little donut. And why am I doing that? Because then I can come up right against the edges of that and just lightly bump into it. And it, and I get this really soft edge. Um, and then I can bring my darks down into some of these cracks here. Bring some darks into some cracks. Uh, 
Uh, there is a really, really hard edge. What I'm going to do is just kind of tickle it with my brush a little bit, make it a little bit of a softer edge. And so I'll often put in the shadow first. Um, I find that if I put a shadow in at the end of a drawing, then if I've got all sorts of like little patterns and details, my shadow messes everything up. Well, like, oh dear, I'm sorry, I did that. I'm gonna dry this. Yeah. It wasn't dry and I touched it with my fingers. I'm gonna try to fix that. Moral of the story, don't touch your paint until it's dry. Uh, and I think I can get that back. All right, that'll have to do. Now I'm going to dry it. Oh. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to um, put on top of this shadow, I'm going to put some colors in here. And this shadow is going to show through those other colors. And here's my general strategy. In this area here, I'm going to try to have some parts where it's still just light paper. And then around the edges of that, it's going to be a little bit more yellowy. And then around the edges of that, orange. Why? Well, check back my pumpkin friend again. This is a more yellow orange than this is over here. See that little bit of yellow in there? And then there's this kind of highlight zone here where you're seeing the reflection of my window. But then there's this yellow zone around it, and then it's getting more orangey to the edges. So I've got this gradation from really light to yellow to orange. So to get this to be smooth blends, I'm going to do what's called wet in wet painting, which means my pumpkin gets wet, not too wet, or any color that I put in will just go bleh, right? But I'm going to get it damp. So damp paper. And then while it's still damp, so at this point, I'm going to have to act quickly. I'm going to quickly go get some yellowish paint and put that in a circle. Um, and it will start to kind of bleed smoothly into the white part. And then on the outside edges of that, some more orange. And I'll let that down. The, the purple shadow should stay in place because I'm not going to really kind of scrub at it. It should more or less stay there. And I'll have that purple shadow then showing through in the background. So I first put in my shadow, and now I'm going to put on top of that this more sort of more playful, wet and wet, pale to yellow to orange bit of business. Let's see what we can do. Everybody's dry? Yes, we are. Good. All right. So everybody's dry. And in here, see, I just put a bunch of water in there. I am then test some color over here. I'm going to put some yellow here. And then that's going to go out into more. Oh, I slopped it over the edge there. That sometimes happens. I should be a little bit more careful. So now I am going to come around some of the edges. And the paper is still damp. And into some of these cracks, I'm going to put a little bit of orange going up there. Of 
gray is still showing through nicely. And I'm not liking the way that some of these colors blended together, but rather than getting in there and messing with it right now, I'm going to actually let this dry, and I'll show you why in a moment. So I'm going to let this dry. Okay. Experiment with a light on the table here and see if that helps you see what I'm getting a little bit more accurately. Uh, keeps wanting to adjust for the light. All right. <clears throat> um, so what I'm going to do now, because like I like some of the blending that is happening in here. I don't like this, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some water over this and then let some... Um, sort of redo um, a little bit of paint into there. The water here. Finally, I'm coming in here with just a few little, I've got some red paint on my, on the tip of my brush here. And I'm coming in, just adding a few little dark accents. I like that better now. Kind of got a lighter spot kind of going from yellow into more orange. And places where I did slap this stuff out here into the background a little bit and wish that that didn't happen. But I'm going to show you kind of a fun way to hide that. One, I can just leave it the way that it is. But if I want this pumpkin to feel like it is really glowing and bright, one thing I can do is to have something next to it that is really dark. So if in a little bit of my pumpkin background here, I'm going to have to turn this around so I can get my hand at a better angle here. There you go. I just have some dark blue paint here. And this dark blue paint is called in Dathrum blue and it's like really fun, super dark. Doesn't this make this pumpkin look more glowy? And you can even do fun things like this, like get part of your paper wet out here. And then take the endatherin blue and hit that. And it's as so you watch it sort of start to kind of creep out into there. Yeah. Here's my little glowy pumpkin. Hi, pumpkin. That's a bit of my traditional pumpkin, but I've also got this from a just a straight up side view. And, and what I would like to even notice that things get a lot more interesting when you can start to see just a little bit of that. 
right? So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a moment just playing with this little gorgeous moment and, and, and how, how we go about that. First notice that a bunch of these lines, they, they come up and you can, if I, if you see, well, if you follow an individual line, let's try that one over here. Uh, oh, right here. Is that one? So it comes up and goes down. So you see these lines come up and then hook down. Across here on this front edge, you don't really see them hook down. But uh, the pumpkin is starting to smash the papers that I put in underneath it. I'm going to tilt it up just a little bit more. There. So do you see how in the back here we're seeing these come down? But on this front edge here, there's a little front edge here where you're just seeing, you're not seeing the drop down part. You're just seeing it kind of come up to the edge. And then we don't know when we don't see what happens. But in the background, whoop, 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 whoop. we've got all these little curves coming in. Right? So this is a neat observation. And if we uh, kind of were to do that in a, in a diagram form, um, say this is the, uh, let's say this, this is the, 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 the top of your pumpkin there. You're going to have the front edge of your pumpkin, this edge that you can't see beyond. And behind that is uh, in here somewhere is that little that stem that is sticking out. Let's put it in here. Forget the exact shape of it, but let's have this one just it's going to occupy some some part of the, the little shape in here. But in here, on this edge, you're going to have lines that come down, lines that kind of come over, lines that come over more, lines that come. If I try, try not to have these all be the same size, so some skinnier, some bigger, right? And if I'm drawing these edges that are close to me, I'm seeing that they come up. And the one in the center, well, maybe draw that one in the center first. But here, this one is going to tuck in behind that. And this one is going to tuck a little bit over here and in behind that. And this one is going to come up and it is tucking down behind this. And this one here tucks over the center. So to put this one in first. And then these other ones tuck up against that. Put this one in first, and then these ones tuck up against that. And that's different than what's going on in the background. Because in the background, you're actually seeing them come up over the edge. So if we, um, so there's going to be one in the background that is coming straight down like that. Others are coming up. And then what you're doing is you're seeing them drop down into this space here towards, imagine this thing coming down and having its base here. All these lines are coming into the base of this stem. So another little line perhaps is coming out here and then it tucks in here. And the direction that these go is going to fan so if there's another one that is coming in here, it's not going to come in this angle. It's going to be coming in down at some angle, perhaps like this. See, one coming in here, one coming out here would be like this. One coming in here would be like this. One coming in here. And then we're going to curve that over the top of the pumpkin. So you want to have some of these like that. And remember these little bumps here, do, 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 bump, bump, bump. We want to have these also can do their own kind of tucking behind each other. So this little top of the pumpkin part. And we 
heading down this way. This little portion of the pumpkin drawing, just spend a little bit more time thinking about how you're going to draw that. And that will make a huge difference. So uh, some parts you can be kind of fast, but pay attention to expect to see this ledge, this edge here, this edge that you cannot see the underside. And then expect to see the stuff in the back. Where, whoop, whoop, whoop. Let's put that real pumpkin up there again. All right. Make a little drawing of what you see there. Oh, I, I like the way that this fans out. And you get this sort of sense of the, the, the little stem that comes in here. It's going to fan out into this. Let's make a drawing. Don't worry about the whole pumpkin. But let's just do a little study of that. And, you know, the, the geometry of this and this straight edge. And then these things, notice that we're coming in more at this from uh, the sides here or the sides here and the sides here. And then the more that they get towards the back, you're really seeing these come down. I'm gonna draw in some of these edges to make them a little bit more apparent in the back. You see those angle changes? Get those guys coming in on the back and they come up. Oops, uh oh, this whole thing is tilting, tilting over. things like that line that's going to sculpt this pumpkin and at the free oh, sorry about that everybody that's kind of the same view kind of um this um you know initially views like this it's, it's challenging some people say like i'm just gonna stick with a straight profile but but push yourself just a little bit outside of your comfort zone start to play with these sorts of things and kind of like i want to wrap my my brain around what is the geometry here if i can see the general pattern it's easier then for me to spot it on the pumpkin and then transfer that to the lines that i make So let's so can continue your, your sketch of the top of this 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 pumpkin stuff. Um, and while you're doing that, I want to introduce the next concept because I'm going to get into um, these decorative boards. I can't cut this one up because Carolyn wants it when we're done with this. Um, but uh, so here are some some gourds that just have really bizarre shapes to them. Like, look at it. Bob here, right? Um, wow, that's 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 weird. Um, and uh, these are are actually agriculturally selected for things that have really really weird shapes. Um, and so there's there's just it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of look for if you're looking for some just challenging things go get yourself some gourds uh, all of these were in the discount please take me bin out in front of my local Safeway um, and uh, because they think that nobody has has uh, wants to have decorative gourds right now give them 
a few weeks and then everybody was like, oh, God, I get myself some good decorative cords. But um, these, this one has these cool ridges and this one, lots of bumps. So what I want to do is just to spend a little bit of time with ridges and bumps because this is another big concept, whether you're drawing clothing, whether you are, are, are drawing, you know, distant hills, um, a mountains coming down, an alluvial fan coming out of, of, of a mountain. This ridges and bumps concept has a lot of application and it'll help you draw your gourd, but you also will see it's going to help you draw all sorts of other things that you see. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to move this guy just uh, so I don't accidentally knock it over. All right. Okay. There you go. Um, here's, here's the, here's the big thing. Um, Imagine that, that, so this is, this is a ridge. This is a ridge of, 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 of some subject. If it is like this, at this angle, you see along the top edge here, a clear line between what is the ridge and what is not the ridge up here, right? If I turn it around this way, now you see this side and you see the top of the ridge, but you don't see the side in the back. You knew that already. So why is this important? The reason that it's important is because this view here, right, where where you have um, the, 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 the view where this is coming towards you and it's going to go from you're seeing this side to this side is going to be the critical thing to notice. And most importantly, so drawing this, the a ridge that is going this way and drawing a ridge that's going this way, it's going to be straightforward. You draw the top line, right? And, but how do you handle it when they start to come more towards you? So I just got a weird thumbs up. Right. Um, so how do you handle it when you, um, when it, when it's coming towards you? This as, as the ridges go from this to this, that's the thing that confuses people. Also, if you're drawing ridges uh, on, on a distant mountain, you can see these hills coming around. And then if there's a hill that is a, a range that is coming straight towards you, everybody gets confused. Everybody can draw this one. Everybody can draw this one, but not this one. So we're going to handle this. How do you handle it when there's ridges and one of them happens to come towards you? So let's say we're looking at this view here actually let's go down to the the document camera well, we're going to back up a little bit that's the wrong way all right so if i hold it like this right um notice here that i see a very clean line right here along this side of the ridge, right? It comes over the top and drops down onto the other side. Um, there is a color change here because of the, the, the color of the gourd, but um, but this 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 angle here is 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 more difficult to draw. Let's look on this thing here. Right, so here I clearly see this edge, and I know I can draw this ridge as this line. I draw this ridge as this line. Over here, right, I have this edge of my gourd here, but the one that is confusing is the one that is coming straight down here. If I handle this center ridge well, it'll make these make a lot more sense. So if I'm looking at a gourd here and I'm looking over here on this side and I can see I have a ridge that comes down here. I look over here on this side, I have a ridge that comes over there. Um, 
those two, again, they're going to be straightforward on how do I draw them. The critical thing is going to be for me to how do I handle a ridge that is the one that is coming straight down towards me and still make that make sense. So let's let's do that. Um, I'm going to put all of these ridges onto a ball. Oops. Here. Whoop. And then we'll zoom in. All right. So I've lightly, intentionally, very lightly drawn myself a ball. And now what I'm going to do is on top of this ball, I'm going to have some ridges that come down. And I'm going to have one. Uh, so let's think about these little kind of half moon shapes or kind of crescent moon shapes. So if I have a ridge that is coming down here, I'm going to see the far side of it as kind of a clear line. But this ridge in cross section, it has a part that comes up. There's the top part of the ridge, and then it comes down. Let's take a look at these. You can see there's the part that comes up, there's the top part of the ridge, and then it comes down on the other side of it. So these have a definite top. They're not a knife edge ridge. So somewhere in here is going to be my inflection point with that that ridge if i draw another line here it's not going to really work because i don't really have a crisp edge where the top ends and the next side comes down but i want to suggest that little inflection point so an inflection point means the, the place where we change from being the flat on the top to the where's that change in angle i want to suggest that and one way i can suggest that is um, I can put in a set of sort of small lines that are kind of coming in here that are kind of going down. I'm going to start them. I'm imagine that this ridge occupies this area here, right? I can give myself a few dots. And then we're going to have some lines that are going to come down from that towards the center here. And so what you're, you're trying to get people to think is that they're, they're, they're seeing a little bit of a kind of almost like a hint of a little shadow. So if I'm doing it with lines, I would do it that way. If I were doing it with tone, um, I would do it this way. I can put in just a little bit of shadow in here. And I'm trying to show that there is there is this inflection point between, I've got the clear outside edge of this, and then I have this, this little ridge that comes down. Let's put in one more out here. I've got the the far side of my ridge. And this time I'm not going to see as much of that flat surface. And so in here, but I'm wanting to leave some part, especially on this top surface, that is really catching that light. I can also put in a few places along it, a little bit of a line. 
just suggesting there are some places where this this ridge kind of comes over and has a little bit of an overhang there. So a few places, you know, can get a little bit of a line and that helps people sort of see that like, oh, this is <clears throat> your little. Now the, the hard one is the one that is pointing towards you. The thing that is pointing towards you. And so let's just take a look at that underneath the screen. So essentially what you're seeing here is um, you're seeing the edge pointing towards you. I can see almost lines on either side in some places. In some places where it's a little bit wider, like in here, I on this left side, on this side, I see a little bit more of a line. On this other side, it's not as clear because it's at a, it's not as a steep an angle. So if there's a part that is really narrow coming towards me, I can then get away with doing, you know, a set of parallel lines. There are other places where it's going to be more fanned out. And what I'm going to try to, and let's say if light is coming from this direction, I can put shadow on one side. And that shadow is then support, suggesting that I have this ridge that is sticking out. Give it a few places where there's kind of kind of a continuation of that line. Remember that variable line that's our friend. See how boring that part of the line is? I need more variation. Um, and there'll be some other places in here where I'm just gonna kind of just suggest a little bit that there's thickness to this line, a little bit of a shadow on the other side, or some lines kind of radiating out from it. And then that's going to be this one that is pointing towards me. But if I get in here and I draw a heavy line down both sides, that's not going to, that's not going to feel right. This one here, the one that's pointing towards me, I want to kind of keep it a little bit more subtle. All right. And so you want there to be places where, um, so not doing this on either side of that center one. Now, if there's another little ridge here, let's give this one more line variation. And I can suggest then that there are lines or ridges along any along any subject. And the same is true with bumps. Let's think about bumps on the surface of an object. If I have a ball and my light is going to be coming from this direction here. Right, so light is shining down, making this area my darkest, I mean my lightest. This area over here, my darkest. Um, let's think about how dots or bumps are going to look on any side of it. Here's an exaggerated bump. When I point the bump towards you, you don't see its edges. If I tilt that bump to the little side, you see the contour of the edge here, and you see the inner surface of it here. Let's look at this bump here. When it's pointing straight towards you, I might see a shadow on one side, but I'm not seeing a clear edge of the bump like I'm getting over here or over here. Here, I've just got this bump that is sticking towards me. So I'm going to keep this one more subtle. If I'm looking up at a bump, I can see a top edge. If I'm looking down at a bump, right, 
I can see its bottom edge. But if I'm looking straight on on a bump, I just have a little shadow over part of it. So that means the bumps that are going to be the hardest to draw are the ones that are on the side of the, the object that is facing towards you. This is the one where I'm not going to draw one of the edges of the bump. And I just might have a faint shadow on the side where, let's go over something a little bit darker. I can put a little shadow in here and say, look, I have a bump. And on this side of the bump, I don't want that little line in there. There's a bump that is pointing towards me. Now, if there's a bump that's a little bit further out here, notice that the bump gets a clear edge on this side, but not on this side. So I'm going to then put another bump right here. This bump gets an edge, a little bit of an edge. And if there's a bump that's even further out here, it gets more of an edge. So it gets a little bit of a shadow behind it. And if there's a bump that is over here, that bump then gets a clear edge on this side, but you lose that clear edge on this side. So I can have a little suggestion of a bump edge here and one that's further out here. I'm going to see an even bigger bump. So this one here, I'm not drawing anything that's sticking up. A little bit of a ridge here, a bigger ridge here. And same thing over here on the sides. The further I get out, watch this bump, the further it comes out to the side, the taller the bump it appears. So on the same is true for bumps above and for bumps below. You want to think of, is this bump pointing at me? Right. So on, on an object like this, you can have a bunch of different surfaces that are pointing at you. Like right here is a big long surface. So at this kind of an angle, um, you know, you can get a bunch of different bumps that are pointing at you. And then um, over here, but if you're kind of looking up at a bump like this, then you see I've got those ones that are further away from me. I'm seeing a top edge, but the bottom edge is less distinct. So I'm going to come over here. Well, that one is really crisp all the way down to that. The ground. So if I were seeing something like this, where I see a nice kind of crisp bottom, I can do that, All right? As a matter of fact, let's just drop that one in here. So maybe there's a bump and it has a crisp bottom edge. And over here, maybe there's another one that has this another crisp bottom edge. But a bunch of these will also be things out here that don't have a crisp bottom edge, and you're just going to get a bump. You see what I'm doing is I'm imagining if this is my center bump, this is the center of a rounded form, everything out in any direction from it, I am going to kind of get this increasing bump profile. 
So if it has- awesome. uh, Could you, uh, oh. perfect, thank you. So a bump out here. I've got my sort of profile of my kind of outer bump. Here's a bigger bump that is sticking up out here, right? If these have a crisp edge, like we saw on some of these, right? I can draw that in. If not, there's this open side here. Sometimes what I will do is I can suggest the change in angles as we go up this open side by imagine a line coming along the bottom of the flat surface of the gourd and hitting this and turning up. So you see this line comes down my bump, hits this flat surface and then changes its angle. That helps people see like, oh, look, there's a change in direction right there. Um, but then this allows me just to sort of put a bump anywhere on here. Again, many of them are not going to have like, many of them are not going to have a really crisp bottom edge. Some of these guys do here, but a lot of these bumps, they just sort of, they kind of, they come down and then they blend down. So if they come down and they blend down, then I have a bump. I have the further out here, the more I'm seeing big bump profile. So now I've got a bunch of bumps. And you see, I'm, keep, I'm, I'm kind of imagining these as cups that are pointing towards the center here. So the arch part of my bump is going to point towards this center ground. Now, let's say that's all the bumps I have. Just so you know, um, quick time check. We have about 13 minutes left. Excellent. I'm going to put some shadows on some bumps, and then we'll have a good chance to, 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 to play with it. So if the light is coming this way, this bump here, it got a shadow across it here. This one over here, it's got shadows out on the backside. But you know, you're the um, this over here, we've got shadows on this side of the bump. Over here, we're going to shadow our bump on this side. And then I'm going to give it a little shadow that sticks out here. This one here, we have shadows on my shadows want to kind of maintain a common um, a common light direction so if light is coming in here then um, all my shadows are going to be on the same side. And then I want to think of part of this whole sphere is also in shadow. And if you're a bump, you stick up above that. You might catch a little bit more light maybe on your top. Out here, these bumps are all going to be in darkness. And then I can just, I'm going to add in just a few more bumps. Put another bump in right in here. 
and the 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 shape of the hook here. Um, I'm just sort of thinking of where this shadow is going to be. If lights coming in. So there's some strategy in how we place our bumps, um, how we suggest our bumps. The bumps that are looking out at you are the most difficult bumps because we have a tendency to want to draw a circle around the bump. Some bumps with very defined edges, that actually works. For bumps with, with a less of a defined edge, very often a shadow defines that bump. And then you have, for things that are further out, you'll start to see the edge of that bump. But for ones that you're looking down on, the bumps that you're looking down on, the ridges that you look, on, that look down on, those are the ones that are the, the most difficult. Um, so what I'm going to do now is back up here and I am going to put, onto the page here, two gorgeous chords. And what I would like you to do is to make, don't think of it as a portrait. Uh, don't think of it as a, you know, a, a fancy diagram that you, you need to make. Think of it as just a little study in, can I suggest the ridges? Can I suggest the bumps in these different places? And let's play with that a little bit. Get your own piece of paper. You don't even have to do the whole gourd. You can say like, I'm just gonna draw a little piece of the skin right over here. How would I suggest these bumps? How would I suggest this texture? I'm gonna just try to do a little, draw yourself a little circle and just kind of get this little piece in here. Um, how would I suggest the bumps? How would I suggest the ridges? Or how would I suggest going from this ridge to this ridge to this ridge to this ridge? How would I do that with line? How would I do that with, um, if I'm using tone? So if you prefer to use line, use line. If you prefer to use tone, use tone. But let's just see if we can get a little sense of that texture. So Jack, we have about eight minutes left in class and we do want to have some time for Gideon to come on again at the end with the children's maybe in about um, five minutes. So I just want to give you that heads up. Great. Um, and also, uh, I, I, I do want to uh, remind folks uh, about my challenge. Each year, I um, take a look at the budget that I have and I um, I always put a certain portion of that into donations for organizations and programs that I want to support. Um, this year, I've decided that Amani is going to be um, an organization that I really want to, to get behind. I really love what they are doing there. Um, they're doing a lot with, uh, uh, with, with a little. Um, and so the, the donation goes really, really far in an organization like that. And so I am putting up um, as a challenge to our community a, um, a $1,000 challenge grant. I will donate $1,000 matching um, uh, donations that come in from any of us. And I would um, do not, if this is not something that you can afford to do at this time, I do not feel bad, do not feel guilty. Um, uh, if you are able to help me out with this uh, with this uh, challenge grant, um, it would be really fun. And so I'd like to in, in invite you to please um, do that with me. Um, also, the um, 
the donation uh, the ability to, to donate to Amani, that link is going to remain, that the link is always open and you can find it. Um, consider, I would like to invite people to consider a portion of the, um, of, 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 of what you uh, receive each year as being something that you can give. Um, if you're able to do that, um, our world needs it at this time. Let's go, let's play with these ridges and bumps and we'll be joining Gideon in just a moment. Sometimes if you feel overwhelmed by drawing a um, an entire object, like I have to draw this whole gourd, just pick a little snippet of it and then another little snippet and see if you can get the texture just in that place. Can you make that look like a ridge? Can you make that look like a crevice? Can you make that look like a bump? Can you make that look like a cluster of those bumps? A cluster of bumps making a ridge. These sorts of studies you can apply to drawing anything before you. So at this time, we would love to bring our friend Gideon um, back into the, 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 the conversation. Um, and we're going to be minimizing these gourds, but, um, and I'm going to, why don't we take away um, the, uh, so, um, Hey there, friends. Um, hey. I, I know it's really late over there. Um, so <laughs> thank you for what, what 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 time is it right now? Uh, two, uh, four minutes to eleven. Oh, see, all right. You know, you guys are staying up late for us. Um, we just want to know that we appreciate you. We see you, and we um, and I I I'm just so delighted that all of uh, the community there at Amani is is diving into learning about the world through art um, and connecting with the natural world around them through their journals as well. Um, so, um, Gideon, the the floor is yours. I'm going to minimize my window so that you can we can make your screen bigger. And there we go. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to say. Uh... Thank you. Use this opportunity to uh, thank you all uh, team for preparing this because uh, our kids, the budding artists, uh, dedicated uh, scholars, future scientists, and potential leaders uh, have uh, uh, incredible dreams and the resilience to overcome the challenge to overcome challenges. Uh, but they also need our uh, continuous assistance proper nutrition and stable diet, which are essential for their growth and development. Uh, your generosity tonight ensures that these children, um, our fellow friends, uh, have access to nutritious meals, a stable environment, and the opportunity to reach uh, their full potential. Uh, when we work together, I mean, uh, uh, the, the foundation provides the fuel for them to excel, and shine on their on their own. Uh, we invite you to stay a part of uh, uh, of our community, uh, follow our student journeys, and we continue our work together to wave and art to have art and empower empowerment together to uh, touch lives. Uh, please uh, be uh, informed that your support is putting food on tables, uh, brightening the their futures and changing their lives. 
And uh, together we can continue to nurture their dreams and potential of these uh, our fellow, our, our beautiful children. Uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Kate, uh, my fellow uh, staffs who um, unfortunately are not here, uh, our beautiful children, we say thank you for all the all, all the um, wonderful work you've been uh, putting, you've been showing, and uh, everyone who was involved today. We say thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate every bit of uh, detail you have given us today. Sante San. Uh, 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 Asante, to to you and uh, all of the children, um, thank you so much for being with us. Um, I also want to to thank um, uh, our 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 in country partner um, Kate Thompson uh, with the Amani Foundation um, and uh, Beth uh, Gologli and Avea Moore from the Wild Wonder Foundation who have helped uh, logistics behind the scene here. Um, we look forward, uh, Gideon, to doing more with uh, with with you soon, and um, and take care. Have a really good night, everybody. We hope you sleep very well, and thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Bye.